that I'm going to talk about, uh, well, it's supposed to uh, uh, feature uh, a little bit of geometry, some groups, uh, and measurable dynamics uh, together. Um, it's based on uh, joint work with uh, Uri Bader, Pierre-Emmanuel Capras, um, and uh, um, Alessandro Sisto. Um, and it's based and related to uh, some other work with, uh, with this joint, just with uh, Uripader. I'm not sure if uh, we're going to get there, but... Uh, so, um, a problem... Uh, a problem that I want to discuss... Uh, first is the following, it's kind of uh, natural. Um, Geometric problem, suppose that you have a group, given a group, gamma, and I'm thinking of uh, just countable groups uh, with discrete topology. Uh, one can study uh, hyperbolic structures on gamma. So uh, what are those? Uh, well, if, you, if your group is finitely generated, you can uh, set up a Cayley graph. And uh, as we all know and love, uh, if your Cayley graph happens to have this property of thin triangles, um, uh, this, uh, this is very fruitful. Uh, these are hyperbolic groups, and we know plenty about them. Uh, in particular, this notion of uh, hyperbolicity turns out to be independent of your choice of generators. So if you change your generators, then the Cayley graph changes up to quasi-isometry, and uh, uh, the new Cayley graph happens to be hyperbolic if and only if the original one is. So this is actually a property of a group. But one can think of this as a... <clears throat> So if I have a finitely generated group, uh, then any two finite sets of generators define this metric structure on the Cayley graph, and they are all uh, quasi-symmetric equivalent to each other. So this notion becomes just notion of these structures given by finite word metrics on gamma. Again, if it is uh, hyperbolic, that's beautiful. Otherwise, we don't know. I mean. Interesting still. Now, what happens if you, uh, instead of finite set of generators, you consider infinite sets of generators? Then things become less familiar, they're a little bit weird. So if I have some subset of gamma, uh, which generates, and suppose that it is also symmetric, uh, one can still look at the Cayley graph of gamma with respect to this set of generators. This is going to be a graph where distance between uh, vertices, so vertices are still elements of gamma, and the distance is just how many s elements you need to multiply to reach there. If this generating is connected, uh, this, this graph becomes connected. But now this gra graph is not proper. If s is infinite, then uh, the origin is connected to infinitely many points, and so on. But one can still ask for uh, this graph to be delta hyperbolic and try to uh, get some information out of it. So uh, this leads to this notion of different hyperbolic structures on gamma, by which we will mean, for example, uh, those uh, Cayley graphs, which are uh, obtained by possibly infinite sets of generators for which um, the graph structure is delta hyperbolic. And again, 
we are only interested in understanding them up to quasi-isometries. So one can actually put this in a uh, maybe better, broader context, and this is the following. So uh, now I'm discussing hyperbolic structures. On gamma. Uh, and uh, by this, we, we take uh, this to be a gram of hyperbolic space. Not necessarily, not necessarily proper. So uh, balls might be not pre-compact. And we consider an action of gamma by isometries on that space. And uh, let's assume that this action is non-elementary. and unbounded. So what does it mean to be unbounded? It means that the orbit of uh, any point is not bounded in my, sp in my set, in my space. If it is true for one point, it's true for all points. Uh, and non-elementary means that it does not fix a point at infinity or a pair of points at infinity. I don't want to write down those things because they become a little technical, one needs to define notion of Gromov of boundary of such space and all that. This uh, is familiar in literature, but the picture is always the same. So uh, if your space happens to be hyperbolic plane, for example, uh, and your gamma is just some uh, subgroup of uh, BSL2R, then being non-elementary means not to fix a point at infinity. In other words, not to be conjugate into parabolic subgroup or not to be, not to fix a pair of points at infinity, which means that you are not fixing a geodesic line. Uh, and unbounded is not being pre-compact. But anyway, they, these notions are more general abstract settings. So suppose that you have such gamma uh, in uh, acting on this space. This defines for us um, a kind of length function on gamma or a pullback of a metric D through the action. So maybe I'll put uh, letter L for length function. So given this, uh, maybe rho, uh, L sub rho is going to be um, now uh, the length function associated to, to this action. So we fix some base point in our space and then this is just the distance in my space between rho gamma x naught and x naught. Okay, then this length function satisfies certain uh, things. One of them comes from triangle inequality. And another from symmetry. Um, but most importantly, it remembers somehow underlying hyperbolicity. Plus, uh, and this is the thing that uh, I'm really interested in, but I cannot write it directly, but one can imagine the translation of the delta hyperbolistic condition phrased in terms of the metric. It's not going to be pretty, so I'm not going to write it down, but this is the underlying principle. So a hyperbolic structure uh, on gamma is an equivalence class of uh, such like this, length functions, uh, where I consider L to be equivalent to L prime um, if, if they're by Lipschitz, if uh, there exists some constants K and A such that L prime of gamma is less or equal than 
<clears throat> okay, and uh, so this is a hyperbolic structure. Now, I I want to say that um, so example. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that uh, if gamma is uh, gram of hyperbolic, finitely generated group, then uh, it has infinitely many hyperbolic structures. It has only one really good, excellent structure which is associated with finite generating sets. But one of the features of gram of hyperbolic uh, groups is that they have plenty of quotients. You can take very long elements and uh, kill it and you know look at the group. Normal group generated by it, it becomes non-trivial. And these quotients, each one of them is going to be a hyperbolic group. So each one of them has its own finite generating sets. If you pull back these finite generating sets, you're going to get infinite generating sets for your original group. But the Cayley graph on the original group associated to these uh, pulled back sets is going to be essentially the Cayley graph of the quotient, the usual Cayley graph of the quotient. And there are plenty of those and they're all incompatible with each other. So normal Gromov of hyperbolic groups have many, many, many hyperbolic structures. And the question that uh, we would like to discuss is uh, situations where you have uh, few hyperbolic structures. Now, where are my notes? So this question was uh, actually addressed by uh, by Carolyn Abbott Sahana Bala Bala Subramania and Dennis Osin. Um, and they specifically uh, constructed groups which are uh, um, finitely generated groups for which there are only fi uh, finitely many, any finite number n um, of possible uh, hyperbolic structures on gamma uh, that are associated with the uh, Cayley graphs with the uh, infinite sets. Uh, I mean, the infinite I just added, but there are only finitely many of those. So in, uh, uh, in the work with uh, Uri Bader, Pierre Manuel Capras, and Alessandro Sisto, uh, we want to discuss some very natural examples that are not constructed in an abstract way, but in very concrete ways uh, with these properties. And we, we actually uh, want to look at uh, this more general setting. So this setting and these settings are not exactly equivalent because uh, what we want to study are uh, pullbacks of length functions coming from non-elementary actions on hyperbolic spaces. Um, but, uh, okay, maybe a picture here. So, okay, it's also going to be a similar picture. But anyway, so it's going to be an action of gamma on some uh, uh, delta hyperbolic space. Um, and you, uh, there is a, a reduction lemma that tells you that you can assume if the action is non-hyperbolic, you can assume that the limit set is everything. But want to consider such actions which are not necessarily co-bounded. Cayley graphs, uh, even associated with the infinite generating sets, they, they are always transitive. They have transitive gamma actions. Uh, so they are kind of, uh, uh, don't have any holes 
Like if you look at the orbits and the convex hull of the orbit, you don't have any unbounded holes remaining. So the, uh, the concept that I put up on this board is slightly more general. Okay. So uh, uh, here is a theorem. Um, so suppose that you take, a, a, well, we like irreducible lattices in high rank, so that's what we do. Uh, so you, you take G to be a product of several groups. Uh, where, uh, so it's direct product of locally compact groups. Um, where G1 to GR are uh, simple higher rank uh, groups of our local fields. Um, and G starting from this index on, Gn, are uh, what, uh, what could be called standard rank one groups. This terminology is due to uh, Pierre Manuel Capras, uh, Yves Cornelier, somewhere, uh, Nicolas Monod and uh, Romain Tessera. And these are uh, some generalizations of, uh, uh, I mean, this is a class of local compact groups that act on either, they act on regular symmetric spaces of rank one, so uh, rank one Lie groups, or they act on trees in, in a nice way. Uh, too transitive on the uh, on the boundary. There are several more detailed conditions that I'm not going to uh, go into right now. But I'll give you examples of uh, what is really happening here for our purposes. Now let's suppose that gamma is a lattice in this product in G, which is, as we said, this product G ends, and this is an irreducible lattice. So uh, being a lattice means that it is a discrete subgroup such that the volume of G mod gamma in terms of the Haar measure is finite. Um, and being irreducible means that uh, it does not have a finite index subgroup that splits as product of lattices in some sub uh, product of those. But this is a fairly common uh, assumption. Then, uh, the only hyperbolic structures on gamma are those that are pulled back from the rank one uh, factors, from rank one Factors. So uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So if you take uh, gamma to be uh, SLN Z, it is a case where you have a lattice in uh, SLN R. This is your G. Uh, this is a simple group. And here I'm assuming N is greater or equal than 3. Uh, then uh, this gamma has no hyperbolic structures on it. In other words, it does not admit any action on delta hyperbolic space, proper or not, which is not elementary. Oh, I forgot the key assumption in, in the main theorem. 
Okay, so there was this, 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 and here we want um, we want r greater or equal than one or n greater or equal than two because it has to be somehow high rank phenomenon. The way I stated it, I, I should have included actual gram of hyperbolic space uh, uh, groups. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it was contradictory. So this is a case where R is one. And N is one. There are no rank one factors to pull things from, so there is no hyperbolic structures. So this theorem was known, one of the, uh, I mean, I think it was known in different disguises, but uh, one of the recent uh, arguments is uh, due to Hatael, but um, uh, this provides uh, an alternative argument. Another example to maybe uh, keep in mind is uh, when you have some primes, So suppose that you have a few primes, which are all distinct, um, and you look at the group gamma, which is SL2, with uh, um, coefficients which are rational numbers uh, with denominators that involve only these primes. Okay, so, uh, SL2 with some restriction on the entries of the matrices. Now, this guy is a lattice in a product, so these are rational numbers. They, they, uh, they can be embedded in uh, um, several uh, local fields. One of them is R, and some others are the periodic integers. And if you look at that embedding in the, uh, only in the relevant completions of Q, namely the ones with that here, then you will see that this is a lattice here. It's irreducible lattice. Now, if I assume that I have at least one prime, then, uh, I mean, all of these are standard rank one groups. And um, I need at least uh, <coughs> two of them, so I need at least one prime. But once I uh, had that, um, this group fits into that theorem with uh, um, n greater uh, n being, uh, so here we have uh, r being zero, but n being one plus l. Okay, and uh, in this story, we have L plus one, M plus one uh, hyperbolic structures. They come from the gamma action on the usual hyperbolic plane, or the gamma action on the bus ser trees coming from these factors. Okay, and Uh, another example, uh, if I have a quadratic form in five variables given by uh, quadratic form given in uh, these variables, it's a, a rather standard uh, construction to look at the orthogonal, special orthogonal group that uh, preserves this inner product. Uh, so you can write it down in matrices in uh, concrete ways, but I wasted too much time to uh, discuss this at all. But uh, if you look at uh, those matrices which have coefficients in z square root of two, this happens to be an irreducible lattice in the product of a real Lie group of, uh, of form 
uh, 3, 2 times, um, what am I doing, SO for 1. So um, this form is defined over uh, an extension of uh, rationals, which, which is Q square root of 2. And this field has two lives. It has two embeddings in the reals. In one, square root of 2 is the usual square root of 2. In another, it's the minus of it. And uh, this gives us an embedding of that arithmetic lattice in, uh, uh, in two real completions uh, of it, which are, uh, from the standpoint of uh, real Lie groups, are uh, these guys. Now, this is the same, essentially, as isometries of hyperbolic four space, while this is a higher rank guy, simple. So this is a situation where r is equal to 1 and n is equal to 2, because there are two factors here. One of them does not bring any hyperbolic structures with it because it is a high, high rank guy, and this uh, brings one. So this gamma has a single hyperbolic structure. Um, and here I would just uh, write that Burger Moses groups. which are particular lattices and products of uh, certain groups of automorphisms of two trees, they have uh, two hyperbolic structures each. Okay, <coughs> so, <coughs> so these are the statements. Um, what about um, anything measurable or anything about the proofs? Sorry? So each one of them has two hyperbolic structures coming from two trees. Oh, there is another board, you said. Yeah, I want to exercise. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Ah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't realize that there are three. Okay, so uh, what goes into the proof? So uh, there are, so the word super rigidity uh, comes in there. Um, so the key step is to use certain measurable uh, concepts. Um, and uh, key fact is the following. So here we have gamma as, uh, and a lattice uh, in product of uh, some groups, okay? Um, and we also have uh, gamma acting by isometries on some gram of hyperbolic space. Um, now, the groups that we have in mind are uh, uh, groups there in the board which is uh, hidden here, uh, but they are either high rank groups, each one of them uh, acts on its own uh, boundary. These boundaries are what's called flag varieties. Uh, they, the dynamics of these actions is very particular. So these are boundary actions, um, and I will uh, uh, discuss this in a few minutes, a little bit more uh, of the dynamics of that that is relevant for, for us. But I want to think of those not as topological spaces, although they're beautiful topological spaces, but we just want to think of them as certain measure spaces. So these guys come with their uh, Lebesgue measures. 
So this, these are certain measures on the eye. And um, we want something measurable said about uh, those actions. So the key fact here is that if I have a lattice in this product, uh, and on, on one hand, but then this lattice tries to act by isometries on a hyperbolic space in a non-elementary fashion, then there exists an I in this index set, but this I has to come from the rank one pieces only, and a measurable map phi from this bi uh, going to the boundary of x, this is the Gromov boundary, in a gamma equivariant way, such that phi of gamma xi equals or gamma phi of xi for all gammas and gamma and uh, for almost every xi. Now, uh, so this is going to happen only in the um, only in the if if there are rank one factors present. So only through the boundary of this thing, or through the boundaries of this uh, SL twos. Now, if uh, if the G's that you are talking about are um, standard rank one groups which are not Lie groups, then they act on trees and the corresponding bi are the ends of trees that come with the uh, certain canonical measure class. So this is going to be the statement. Okay, so there is this statement and uh, one implication is how to squeeze out of this measurable information the geometric information. So I want to say that um, when I said here that the hyperbolic structures are pulled back from, um, from the rank one factors, what was meant was that these rank one factors, each one of them acts on a certain either symmetric space of rank one, hyperbolic plane or hyperbolic uh, space of high dimension, maybe over complex numbers or quaternions or so, or they come from trees. So uh, what uh, this gives us is that maybe I should have written it that way with the raw, is that the metric defined by uh, this action and a choice of uh, any point is going to be equivalent in this sense to the metric coming from the gamma action on that thing or the corresponding tree. So, so it's no, no, there exists a unique I, thank you. There exists a unique I here, uh, maybe I not, such that uh, there exists a corresponding space. Yeah, I let, let me not decorate this any further. So that there is this boundary map and this measurable information can be translated into the, uh, into the geometric information. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I face a choice of either saying something about uh, uh, this implication or explaining how that comes about. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I won't write anything, but I will say that this equivalence comes from a pair of inequalities. And in one direction, um, you want to say that the unknown length function is bounded uh, by Lipschitz kind of constant. In terms of that function, 
bless you. Um, this information is, uh, is obtained by uh, looking at the following. So if I'm, so uh, I have here the tree or GI mod KI, the symmetric space, uh, and I, I have its boundary, which is this uh, BI, and there is a measurable map from here to X, and here I imagine the boundary of X. So the map phi actually takes the boundary bi to the boundary of x. But uh, the measures feel something about the actions. That's where dynamics is going on. If I have a sequence of elements gamma that stays bounded in my original space, then uh, the dynamics on the boundary is such that uh, the measure is not distorted by too much. So you have, if, if I have a bounded sequence here, then the radon Nicodem derivatives of, uh, if gamma i is a sequence bounded in gi mod ki, then the radon Nicodem derivatives, uh, ah, so I need to uh, use other letters, maybe j. <laughs> Uh, these guys are bounded by some constant, right? And that information, when you push it through phi, tells you that um, something in the uh, push forward space is also bounded. And that can, can be used to say that rho of gamma j's are bounded in x. Okay, so so you get uh, you get some information about this, uh, and and that is responsible for one of the directions. In the other directions, there is another slick argument that uh, uses hyperbolic elements, but I'll uh, uh, but I'll try to uh, to move to the discussion of why this is true, and that's where high rank phenomena uh, occur. So, so something about uh, boundaries. <clears throat> so we wanted to call that stronger boundaries, but uh, uh, you know, Maybe it has some political connotations, so we'll just call it. <laughs> but the term came from the fact that the, the, the concept of boundaries uh, has been around for a long time. Um, Fersenberg, uh, Margulis, Zimmer, uh, uh, through their works. But then uh, Burger and Moses uh, for slightly different purpose from uh, but, but they developed this notion of strong boundaries. And what we need is a strengthening of that. That's why we try to call it stronger boundaries. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the following. So it's abstract concept. You have some group, G. Um, it can be your discrete group or it can be locally compact group. And you are considering its action on some measure space. So this is measure class preserving action, uh, and you want two properties from that. So one, you want that the G action on B is amenable, and second, that the diagonal action of G on B cross B is uh, ergodic with, uh, uh, oh, is metrically ergodic. Which is a certain strengthening of ergodicity. Um, now, uh, 
so the, the, the interesting thing is uh, that, one, this combination of these properties is not empty. You see, this notion of amenability is such that if you have a group action on, on a space and it is amenable, then everything which is above it, so anything which, is, which factors to be, any group action on a space which factors to be, automatically inherits this amenability. So amenability is like uh, going up. It's easy to, so G action on itself is automatically amenable. I'm not going into details. Ergodicity has the tendency of going down. If you have some action uh, which is ergodic, then all of its qu uh, quotients are ergodic. And the point is that you want something which is uh, kind of in the intersection of the two. So typically there is some region here, so there is a, it's not unique intersection. There is a whole class of actions which are both amenable for B and ergodic with this property on B cross B, uh, but uh, uh, that's the non-trivial thing. And of course you play them, these properties, once against the other, uh, but uh, the fact that this thing is not empty uh, is guaranteed by uh, Poisson boundaries in general, or Fürstenberg Poisson boundaries. Um, and there is a, a beautiful paper by uh, Vadim Kaimanovich where he proves that, but uh, he proved that in some context which is slightly weaker than what we need, but uh, essentially the same proof applies. Uh, and uh, boundaries of this form, G mod P, the G action on them, uh, they're also examples of this intersection because amenability comes from amenability of P and this uh, metric ergodicity is a, a fancy reformulation of how Moore's uh, property. So those things exist. So this is uh, item number one. Item number two is that boundaries have nice factorial properties. So if the G action on B is a boundary action in that sense, and if gamma in G is a lattice, then the gamma action on B is a boundary action. So uh, this, in the right terminology, uh, which is stated here, this, these things become an exercise. But if you try to start from Poisson boundary of G, and then you try to find a measure on gamma of which this is Poisson boundary, this is the direction that Furstenberg uh, uh, implemented, this is a much harder exercise. I mean, it's, it's, these are deeper theorems. But if you don't care about random walks themselves, but just about these consequences of random walks, then it's easy to derive them. Now, um, Another aspect of this is that, so this is maybe proposition one, proposition two is that if, if you have a bunch of G's and they act on a bunch of spaces BI and these are all boundaries, then the product acting on the product, each factor acting on its own boundary is still a boundary action. So there is functoriality with respect to multiplications. Okay, and as a corollary, we, the, we get the following. So if we choose, um, 
if we choose boundaries B1, Bn for G1, Gn, and if gamma is a lattice in the product, then its action on these guys is a boundary action. Okay, uh, can I, who, who's the chair? You're the boss? Three minutes? Okay, let me uh, try to wrap it up somehow. I, I won't get to this, uh, one cool idea, but I'll say it, Galois correspondence. Galois is a good name to use. It's going to be used somewhere. Uh, but uh, here is this concept of uh, while groups. I mean, it's a generalization of, uh, uh, of classical while group. And this is the following. So suppose that you have some group and it acts on B and this is a boundary action. The corresponding vial group, we define it to be the automorphisms of B cross B which commute with gamma. So these are automorphisms of measure space that commute with the, uh, with the diagonal action of gamma. So these are kind of extra symmetries that are supposed to be responsible for high rank phenomena. So I want to say that in the case where we have, in the case at hand, so let's put this and that together, uh, case in hand, if I have uh, uh, this product of higher rank Lie groups and possibly some rank one Factors and these are high rank. The and, and I have the actions on the corresponding boundaries. If I look at a lattice in here, and I'm trying to understand possible symmetries of B cross B, well, it will. The, the claim is that this is going to contain the product of classical while groups of these guys. Plus, so one obvious symmetry that you have without thinking at all is flipping the two factors. It's a non-trivial, I mean, if B is not a point, then this is non-trivial uh, symmetry of the diagonal action on, on those spaces. In high rank, simple Lie groups, you have more symmetries, and this is the uh, uh, deeper thing. And in these guys, you don't have anything but those, but you can do it independently for each factor, so you have Z mod 2Z uh, in this multiplicity. So all together, in, in the, under the assumption that you have at least one rank, uh, high rank factor or, or those guys, you see that there are some non-obvious symmetries to the gamma action on this. And hyperbolicity, uh, um, tries to play these extra symmetries with a, against the simple-mindedness of hyperbolic actions. Hyperbolic actions uh, don't have any particular complicated symmetries, and I didn't get to uh, state it, but I think 
Um, I'll probably stop here, but the, uh, this uh, high rank phenomena somehow are encoded in, uh, uh, in, in that line. Okay, thank you. Thank you.